Hello. Uh, it is nice to meet you here. I know there are many people from all over the world who said they would be watching this. So I don't know what to say. Shall I say good evening, good morning or good day, whatever. Uh, we are now all over the world living such a terrible situation. We all put ourselves in our homes and we want this disaster to come to an end as soon as possible. And I wish everyone uh, to be well. And uh, in order to contribute to the situation that we are in now, uh, I thought I would use some of my past experience uh, to share with you so that we can use our time at home uh, more efficiently. I picked a very interesting subject today that is Göbekli Tepe. In my view and in many other people's view as well, it is one of the most important archaeological discoveries in the whole world today uh, of the recent times. Uh, but it is not possible uh, to start Göbekli Tepe right away. That's why I first would like to talk about the situation which prepared Göbekli Tepe. Uh, that's why I want to start with uh, human history uh, and then how Göbekli Tepe was discovered and what they found and how the finds from Göbekli Tepe are all interpreted. Uh, but I know uh, some of you are not familiar with me, just uh, to let you know with a few words. Uh, my name is Sherif, Sherif Yanan. Uh, I'm a tour guide uh, and I've been doing this job uh, still with great enthusiasm for more than 30 years now. And I also wrote lots of uh, travel books, maps, uh, travel documentary films, uh, which are available at amazon.com now. And they are in the picture in here now. And I have an Instagram account and I try to share something interesting from our cultural heritage almost every day. So if you want to uh, follow that, uh, this is my address here, uh, Serif Yenan. Uh, I also have a Facebook page and the name of my Facebook page is Travel in Turkey. If you are a Facebook follower, I have lots of sharings there as well. Uh, I try to uh, concentrate on my YouTube channel in these weeks. I have started making lots of video clips, including uh, lots of interesting information. So my uh, YouTube channel is also under my name, uh, Serif Yenan. Uh, if we start now, uh, I also would like to start uh, with an orientation first. We're talking about Turkey. Uh, and the lands of Turkey throughout history were named as either Anatolia or Asia Minor. Where is Anatolia located? I always ask, see this is the world map and we have here uh, Africa and this is Asia here and Europe is here. If I asked you the meeting point of these three continents, where would you show? Turkey, as you see in here, is located right in the meeting point of these three continents, a juxtaposition. So, uh, as a result of this, uh, of course, uh, Turkey or Anatolia has always been a crossroads between the east and the west, between the north and the south. So, as a result, it has drawn the attention of many great civilizations. We can count approximately more than 30 different civilizations that have ever lived in the lands of Turkey throughout history, which is uh, such an interesting uh, history. If we look at the map of Turkey, just very briefly, as you see, it is rectangular in shape and surrounded by seas in three sides. Uh, and it is a peninsula. Here in the north, uh, it is the Black Sea. Black Sea is a very interesting sea. It is a closed sea, almost like a lake, but it is not closed. It has an opening. There is a little water channel in here, a natural one, connecting the Black Sea to the Sea of Marmara. The Sea of Marmara is a small sea within the boundaries of Turkey. So it is accepted to be the only sea in the world which is located within the boundaries of one country only, 
uh, interesting to note. And the uh, Sea of Marmara is connected to the Aegean Sea in the west with another natural waterway here, and that is the Dardanelles. And then we have the Aegean Sea, and the other side of the Aegean is Greece, and in the south it is the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, there are uh, many rivers flowing into the Black Sea, uh, and the level of the Black Sea, with those rivers flowing into it, uh, is rising up continuously. That's why uh, the Black Sea has to empty its water through the natural waterway here, which is called as the Bosphorus, and then it goes in towards the Aegean Sea in here. Turkey is located uh, at the meeting point of Europe and Asia. So the border between Europe and Asia is here. So the Dardanelles, the Sea of Marmara and the Bosphorus Strait make the border between Europe and Asia. So above here is Europe and below here is Asia. 3% of Turkey lies in Europe and that part of our country is called as Trakya in English, in English uh, sorry, in Turkish, and in English it is Thrace. And the Asian part of Turkey uh, throughout history has been named as Anatolia or Asia Minor. Uh, I love the word Anatolia, it's a Greek word and it means the land of sunrise. Considering the Greeks in the West, uh, this was the land of sunrise. The sun rose from here. That's why they named it accordingly. As for our neighbors a little bit, we have two neighbors in Europe. One of them is Greece and the other is Bulgaria. And we have many more in the east. There is Georgia here. There is Armenia here. There is a little land in here which is called as Nekchivan part of Azerbaijan, an extended land, not the main part of Azerbaijan. And then we have long borders with Iran, and then Iraq, and then long borders with Syria. So we have lots of uh, neighbors. As for geography a little bit, the highest mountain in Turkey is Mount Ararat and it is located near the border in here. It is close to Armenia, it is close to Iran, but it is within the borders of Turkey. As you know, Mount Ararat is the place where Noah's Ark was believed to have landed on. Then we have the largest lake, Lake Van, in here, almost like a sea. Uh, it's a volcanic area, and the water in the uh, lake is bitter water. It is soda water. It is a very rugged and mountainous area there. Then we have two biblical rivers originating from the high mountains of Anatolia and going down to Syria and Iraq. And one of these rivers uh, is called as the Euphrates and the other river is the Tigris. So these are the rivers mentioned also in the Bible. And the uh, two rivers, after a certain point, they merge and flow together. And the land in between these two rivers has been named as Mesopotamia, meaning uh, between the two rivers. We have the second largest lake here. It is in central Anatolia, Lake Tuz. Tuz means salt. It's a salt lake. The uh, water in here has 33% salt in it. And uh, this is the famous region of Cappadocia, a wonderland. Uh, everyone in the world has to be there one day. It doesn't belong to this earth, it is lunar. Uh, and here is the capital city of Turkey, the official capital. Up until 1923, the capital uh, in uh, the Ottoman Empire, in the Byzantine Empire, in the uh, Roman Empire, it was always Constantinople, Istanbul in here, and Istanbul is located today on the two sides of the Bosphorus Strait, which means one side of the city is Europe and the other side is Asia. So Istanbul is accepted to be the only metropolitan city in the world, uh, which is located on two different continents. Uh, up until 1923, Istanbul was the capital, 
but uh, with the founding of the new secular republic by our founding leader Mustafa Kemal Atatürk in 1923, we moved the capital from Istanbul to Ankara. Ankara is the second largest city and Istanbul is still the largest city with approximately 17 million people uh, and it is the cultural capital, it is the financial capital. The third largest city is Izmir in here, that's also my hometown. I think that's enough for now. When we speak about place names uh, in my presentation, uh, we know which places to look at. Just to add one more thing, uh, the area which is close to the Aegean Sea is named as the Aegean region. The area which is around the Sea of Marmara uh, is named as the Marmara region. The lands parallel uh, to the Black Sea coastline, uh, it is the Black Sea region and the Mediterranean region is here, and southeastern Anatolia is here, eastern Anatolia is uh, in the east, and central Anatolia is here. So we know when we mention these names. Now let's start with human history, and uh, how Anatolia was affected uh, with the history of humanity. Let's just take a look at that. Some 20 years ago, or like maybe 18 years ago, in the year 2002, uh, in a city called Denizli, in the Aegean region, inner parts of the Aegean region, uh, in a marble quarry, uh, a worker there, by coincidence, found some bones without knowing what they were. So he gave it to the authorities, and then those bones found their way uh, to the scientists, and they understood that they were pieces of a skeleton, of a human skeleton. Uh, and after uh, lots of surveys and uh, laboratory uh, experiments and so on, they understood that these bones belonged to the skull cap of a Homo erectus. What does this mean? Uh, as you know, uh, Homo erectus, the earliest ancestor of humankind, uh, started its journey from Africa, uh, like two million years ago. Uh, passing through Anatolia, they reached Europe or they reached Asia. So after this uh, discovery now, uh, it was understood that uh, the Homo erectus uh, passed through Anatolia like 1.1 million years ago because these bones were dated to be approximately 1.1 or 1.2 years old and they called it as the Denizli man. Denizli was the name of the city where it was found and these are the pieces. Uh, if you bring these pieces together you get one part of the skull cap. This is also, uh, of course, uh, a very interesting discovery. This Denizli specimen uh, has been the first Homo erectus discovered in Turkey today, 1.1 million years old. Uh, speaking about uh, the Denizli man, I have to make a, a small uh, comparison in here, although it is not from Turkey, but it's a, a good story. In 1974, in Ethiopia, uh, scientists, by coincidence, found many bones together there. So after studying those bones, they understood that they belonged to a hominid. And uh, the date was estimated to be 3.2 millions. And these scientists, after this discovery, were so happy and they were uh, having a party in the evening and listening to music. Uh, and drinking and so on, dancing, and the music playing was repeating continuously. And it was Lucy in the Sky with diamonds uh, from Beatles. So somehow they decided uh, to name uh, this skeleton of the 3.2 million year old hominid as Lucy. So it is now called as Lucy. This is approximately, it is not very tall, approximately 90 to 100 centimeters, like maybe three feet, uh, and 30 to 35 kilograms. Uh, I think this makes like uh, 55, 60, 65 pounds and something like that. Now I would like to start with uh, these periods. Uh, uh, scientists, uh, by looking at the main material used in these ages, 
they divided these periods uh, with the name of the material. So it is first the stone and then uh, it became uh, copper and they named the name of the other, uh, the next period as the Copper Stone Age and then came bronze which is an alloy and after bronze came the Iron Age. So we're going to look at these ages now starting with the Paleolithic Age. Paleolithic Age means the Old Stone Age. Uh, the word paleo is old and lithos is a stone, old stone age. So for the case of Anatolia, it is different in different parts of the world. Uh, things started with uh, the discovery of Homo uh, erectus in Denizli. Uh, it starts, the Paleolithic age in Anatolia starts in about 1.1 million years ago and it continues up until 16,000. So this is uh, uh, the general timeline. But in itself, uh, the Paleolithic age is divided into three periods. The lower, the middle, and the upper Paleolithic. The first one is from 1.1 million up until 125,000. Second one is 125,000 and 40,000. And the third one is between 40,000 and 16,000. And uh, these were the times in which uh, we started seeing the traces of the Homo erectus first, and then the Neanderthal, and then the Homo sapiens. So coming one after another. Who lived in this Paleolithic age? The hunter-gatherers. Who were these hunter-gatherers? These were the early forms of uh, uh, humankind, uh, starting uh, with the uh, Homo erectus and then uh, it continues like that. And uh, they didn't have settled life. They lived in caves and they lived short. Uh, climate conditions were very harsh. And uh, while they were trying to hunt the wild animals, sometimes they were getting hunted by themselves. So they didn't live long and their main concern was food. They always wanted to find food. So how did they find food? They either hunted the wild animals with the simple tools that they made, or they gathered the plants or the plant roots from the nature, and this is how they lived. But uh, unfortunately, the food was not plenty. The food was getting scarce uh, once in a while. Uh, as a result, they always had to go after the food. That's why they couldn't live in one place. They had to migrate to new places after the food was scarce. That's why they are uh, nomadic people and they are called as hunter-gatherers and there is no settled life in this period. Uh, this is an example about their very simple life. Uh, they would sometimes live, uh, in addition to the caves, uh, in little tents that they would make from the animal's skin and some branches of trees and so on. And they would use very simple stone tools in their daily life. This is the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara, in the capital city. Uh, this is a very, very small museum, but in my view, uh, the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara is one of the most important museums in the whole world. So it is also a must-see place. There are so many civilizations exhibited in the same museum in Ankara. This is the first section in that museum. And this is the lower Paleolithic age in, in here. As you see, in the uh, uh, lower Paleolithic period, which was 1.1 million and 125,000, the materials that they used, the Homo erectus, uh, Homo erectus used, very simple stones in these times. And they were trying to make the stones to be sharper. And they would be able to do that only by using other harder stones and they would attach a piece of wood to the stone and it would be uh, a hand axe and uh, so on. In the lower Paleolithic period, uh, the climate was not so bad, it was mild. And this was the time when we start seeing Homo erectus and Homo erectus in that period used hand axe and they found fire, but fire was mostly use, uh, used uh, against wild animals 
and whenever they had dead people, they knew how to bury them. So they had burials in this period. And in the same museum, uh, this is actually the Şanlıurfa Archaeological Museum. Uh, this is from the area of Göbekli Tepe. And we have more examples of these uh, simple stones from those times. Now, the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara again. This is the next section. This section is the Middle Paleolithic Age. Middle Paleolithic Age is between 125,000 and 40,000. And Homo erectus somehow disappear in this period in Anatolia and instead uh, there is another uh, kind which is named as the Neanderthal. Neanderthal is not from the same Homo erectus. They come from Europe and they are more used to living in uh, colder climates and they most of the times uh, spend their time uh, in the caves. So they were the real caveman, actually. In this uh, middle Paleolithic age, the climate gets very harsh. Uh, glacier, glaciers uh, start. Uh, the uh, climate also becomes very dry. Uh, it becomes very difficult and Neanderthal are good in that condition. And uh, the Neanderthal as opposed to the very simple, very coarse stone tools of the earlier period, as you see, they start using uh, more uh, refined or uh, finer tools. And they also start using arrows and spears, you know. By making the size of the stone smaller, uh, they can uh, use them as arrows and spears. Uh, and these Neanderthal people in the Middle Paleolithic age, they also continue with the burials, but they add one more thing to the burials. They start burying people together with some gifts. When you bury someone with some uh, gifts, it means something. What is the meaning? The meaning is that uh, you believe in reincarnation. Those people who die that you bury are going to come back to life. So whatever they might need in their next life, you want to leave them with those people. This is the reason that we have gifts with the burials and this continues all throughout ages afterwards. Fire becomes more common in this uh, period, in Middle Paleolithic, and they start using fire for cooking. So it means uh, they have cooked food uh, in this period. Now we're going to look at the last uh, phase of the uh, Paleolithic age, which is the upper uh, and late upper Paleolithic age from about 40,000 until about 16,000. We are getting close to our time, as you see. Uh, the tools in here are much, much finer. And in addition to the stones, we start uh, seeing flint here, flint tools. Flint, as opposed to normal uh, stone, is uh, much harder. So you can shape stone with flint stone. It is much easier that way. And we also noticed that uh, they were able to make tools from wood. They were able to make tools from uh, animal bones. Uh, and uh, above all, uh, these people, the upper Paleolithic people, uh, were actually the Homo sapiens. When we came to approximately 40,000 to the upper Paleolithic, the Neanderthal disappeared. So uh, scientists uh, don't know how exactly the Neanderthals uh, disappeared. It may be the Homo sapiens, it may be the natural uh, disasters, but it is likely that the uh, Homo sapiens uh, destroyed the Neanderthal. Homo sapiens is coming from Homo erectus, so Homo uh, sapiens is not the extension of the Neanderthal. And in this uh, period, uh, the uh, Homo sapiens were able to make tools to make tools. This is a very big progress. Tools making tools. Uh, this is in interesting and important to note. Little by little, in this Upper Paleolithic period, we also see the start of trade, bartering system. A little bit of weaving. Uh, they started making little boats and they started fishing uh, and they started making pictures in their caves 
and they painted their pictures uh, and they sometimes uh, symbolized uh, some interesting things from their lives. So symbolism started in the Upper Paleolithic Age, which was uh, coming to an end in about uh, 16,000. After all these three phases of the Paleolithic Age, do we have any Paleolithic places in Anatolia? Of course, we have lots of places, but among many others, I'm going to uh, summarize two places which are the most important from Anatolia. And one of these is near Istanbul. It is a cave. When you start driving out of Istanbul on the way to the Bulgarian border area or Greek area uh, in the uh, European part of uh, Istanbul, uh, just a little outside of the city, uh, there is a cave called Yarımburgaz. Such an important place. Yarımburgaz cave has the traces of the lower Paleolithic period, the times of the Homo sapiens, sorry, uh, Homo erectus. The earliest traces of settlement in Turkey uh, were found in the Yarımburgaz cave near uh, Istanbul. And actually, one more thing to add here, scientists found tools and animal bones going as early as 300,000 years before now. And it was understood that Homo erectus lived uh, in this cave in groups of 20 and 25 people. And not only that, there is a very big kind of uh, bear, which is called as Ursus deningeri. And they found the bones of Ursus deningeri in this Yarımburgaz cave. And they also understood that the uh, Ursus deningeri bears and Homo erectus used the same cave uh, alternatively. Uh, this is also something uh, interesting. Uh, in this Yarımburgaz cave, uh, they found traces of uh, Homo erectus, but they didn't find the bones of Homo erectus in here. Let's look at the next cave. Where is this cave? That is Karain. This is also one of the two most important caves from the Paleolithic age in Anatolia. And it is on the Mediterranean coast. Uh, there is a city called Antalya, like a resort place and uh, only uh, like a half hour drive from Antalya to the north from the Mediterranean coast. It is the Karain Cave. And uh, Karain Cave has been the only uh, cave in Turkey with all three phases of the Paleolithic Age. The lower, the middle and the upper Paleolithic Age uh, had traces or left traces in the Karain Cave in here. It was in this cave that uh, scientists, archaeologists, found uh, some uh, bones of the Neanderthal from the Middle uh, Paleolithic Age uh, and also the traces of the Homo sapiens from the Upper Paleolithic Age. In the nearby uh, city of Antalya, there is another beautiful museum of archaeology uh, and in the Antalya Museum, uh, we can see these animal bones, teeth and a horn and these are from the uh, Middle and Upper Paleolithic uh, periods. And uh, this is even more important uh, because the skull bone that we see in here belongs to a Neanderthal. This is also from the uh, Middle Paleolithic age and it is on display in the Antalya Museum. After the Paleolithic age comes to an end in about 16,000, there is another age starting. Uh, this new age is called as the Mesolithic Age. Uh, Mesolithos, Middle Stone Age. Middle Stone Age is a transition period. Middle Stone Age is going to be like uh, 6,000 years from 6,000, sorry, 16,000 until about 10,000. In 10,000, settlements will start. So 10,000 is the beginning of the Neolithic age. Mesolithic age is the transition from the Paleolithic into the Neolithic. And the most important uh, place uh, from the Mesolithic age in Anatolia is a cave called as Öküz Inn. 
Öküz in uh, is also near Karain in Antalya, very uh, close, nearby. And uh, they found some uh, pictures of ox uh, in the cave. That's why they named it as the uh, ox shelter, Öküz in. Uh, so Ox Cave uh, was the name for this place and they found uh, micro tiny tools in this transition period. So this is the transition into Neolithic. Things are getting a lot more serious after this. And uh, they also, uh, as I just mentioned, they found some uh, pictures of uh, Ox. Uh, that's why they came. They named it as the Ox Shelter, uh, Ökuzini, that is the meaning for it. And they uh, found the carvings of these Ox pictures inside the place. Finds from this cave uh, goes, uh, go back to like 4000 uh, BCE, uh, meaning the Chalcolithic Age. So it is not only between 16,000 and 10,000. So people continued using the same uh, cave for thousands of years uh, after the uh, Paleolithic age. The Mesolithic age uh, hasn't been studied extensively in uh, Turkey yet, but things are going very fast and I am sure in the upcoming 10 to 20 years we're going to have a lot more information than what we know uh, today. Now let's look at Mesopotamia a little bit. As you see uh, here is the uh, lands of Anatolia and this is southeastern part of Turkey and these are the two biblical rivers that we were just talking about. Uh, one of them is the Euphrates River and the other is the Tigris River. And as I said, after a certain point, they merge and flow together into the Persian Sea. The land in between these two uh, rivers uh, has been named as Mesopotamia, meaning between the two rivers. As you see, there is a curvy part in here like this. This curvy part is named as the Fertile Crescent. Lots of interesting things happened there. What did happen? At the end of the Upper Paleolithic period, during the Mesolithic Age, in about 15,000, 14,000, 13,000, the glaciers of the previous ages started melting down. Global warming. So, especially in the area of Upper Mesopotamia or Mesopotamia, climate was becoming wonderful. Climate was becoming very mild, moderate. The sun was out and it was green everywhere. And uh, the hunter-gatherers of the all areas around uh, suddenly were attracted with this area. They were going to places where the weather conditions were better, where the living conditions were easier. So as a result, they were coming down or coming up to Mesopotamia, maybe from Eastern Mediterranean region and maybe all the way from Africa as well. These hunter-gatherers were able to find wild wheat, barley and lentils in this area. And they also found uh, the wild sheep, uh, wild boar, uh, the deer and so on. So it was much easier to survive here. That's why uh, there were many groups of people coming over here and living in here. After about uh, approximately maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000 years, these hunter-gatherers somehow were able to obtain seeds from these wheat, barley or lentils. Such a big change. Can you imagine? They were able to obtain seeds from these crops. They learned how to replant them. Things would or will change afterwards. What will happen? They are not going to run after the food anymore. Why? Because they are able to bring the food to themselves. So they start settling down. They start agriculture. They start the domestication of animals and they start settled life first with villages later after a few thousand years with cities so this is the cradle of civilizations that's why we are going to focus on this area now in the area of uh, upper mesopotamia uh, there is a city called batman 
like Batman, <laughs> uh, uh, a little farther away from Batman, 50 kilometers farther away, there is an archaeological dig and the name of the place is Hallan Chemi. Remember this name. This is very important. Why? Because in Hallan Chemi, in 11,000 BC, the end of the uh, Mesolithic Age, it's going to be the beginning of the Neolithic Age, uh, Ice Age ends and we start seeing the early phases of settled life for hunter-gatherers. Hallan Chemi becomes one of the earliest places where settled life starts. This is uh, uh, a very interesting information. Settled life starts a new age. The name of the new age is going to be the Neolithic age. Sometimes, because of the big changes at the beginning of this uh, age, uh, scientists would name it as the Neolithic revolution. It is like a revolution. So you don't have to run after the food anymore. You're going, you are able to bring the food to yourself. It means you're settling down. The Neolithic age, roughly speaking, starts in about 10,000. In some areas, it is 11,000, like in Hallan Chemi, for example. The settled life do not uh, occur overnight. So in that region, it starts like 100 years earlier. In that region, it starts 500 years later. But roughly speaking, the beginning of the Neolithic age is accepted to be 10,000 for the case of Anatolia. And it is going to continue until about 5,500. The Neolithic age also is divided into periods in itself. First few uh, thousands of this Neolithic age is accepted to be pre patri So in the first 2,000 years of the Neolithic age, the people, Homo sapiens, were uh, unable to produce pots. They didn't know how to make pottery. They were able to shape stones and many other things, but they didn't do pottery. Pottery starts in about 8000 BC and it continues until about 5500 and so on. As you see, this is the Neolithic map of Anatolia. There are so many Neolithic sites in Anatolia. And many of these uh, sites were dis discovered only in the last 20 or 30 years. You know why? Very simple. I spoke about these two rivers, Euphrates and the Tigris. Uh, this land is very harsh climate uh, and uh, the summers are really hot. You need a lot of water here. But there are big rivers, but other than that, not enough water not enough rain. That's why in the past 20 or 30 years, Turkey has done lots of water projects in this area, like big dams, sometimes for power, sometimes for irrigation. In those cases, when they planned building some big dams, they knew, they knew that there were some ancient sites underneath, but they had to make the dams so they started making lots of rescue excavations. So as a result of many of these rescue excavations in the past 20, 30 years, archeologists have found lots of interesting discoveries. Uh, things are uh, going uh, very fast and we're learning a lot uh, from these uh, new discoveries. Now uh, let's focus on Göbekli Tepe a little bit. Göbekli Tepe is actually this area. This is an aerial photo of the area. As you see, it is very dry, it is rocky, it is arid, it looks arid and so on. How did this happen? As you see, there is a little tree in here. This is probably the highest hill in the whole area. It is approximately 770 meters high from the sea level which makes uh, 2,500 feet. And the hillside in front of it was, uh, uh, was an agricultural land with not enough water, but still possible uh, to get crops from there. 
Just opposite this place is a village called Örencik. And this uh, Göbekli Tepe site is uh, very close to the uh, Syrian border. There is a nearby big city called Şanlıurfa. Uh, like half an hour drive from the center of Şanlıurfa city. If you go to the east, you are going to reach this area. And uh, this highest hill in here has a mulberry tree. And this is what it is. Near the mulberry tree, there are a few burials, some graves. And they have been there for ages. This mulberry tree is called as the Wish Hill. And we know that every year in the equinox time, when the spring starts, people living around, kind of nomadic people, they would come here. See, nothing happens by coincidence. People from this area know this place and every year in spring, they come here with their herds of animals at a certain time during the equinox and uh, they have some festivities there for fertility. They have some sacrifices there. They eat and they have fun and they enjoy. So nothing happens by coincidence. So this place, even from before, has been known as an important place and people, villagers living in that area, would go to this place and sacrifice their animals, wishing for more uh, fertility and uh, so on. In 1963, two archaeologists, one from the Chicago University and another from the Istanbul University. From Chicago University, it was Robert Braidwood, uh, from the Istanbul University, there is a lady archaeologist, Halet Chamber. They come to this area. They go all around the eastern parts and they see some pieces of stones sticking out from the fields of the farmers. Pieces of big stones. And they see the graves there as well. And they think this would be a medieval Byzantine era uh, cemetery. So they write it down in their report, but they don't stay there. It is recorded in their report, in their survey uh, from 1963 already. But not a Neolithic place, but as a uh, Byzantine place, medieval place. The owner of the land in here is a gentleman called Shavak Yildiz. This is the guy. This guy, while, while plowing his field, he is far away from his village. He doesn't have water there, but he needs uh, those crops from there, wheat. So he comes here and he has his plow and while plowing his land, he finds a statue. A statue of a human uh, with a big sexual organ. He gets surprised. He has a few more pieces of these stones, maybe with an expectation uh, to obtain some money. He puts these uh, uh, sculpture pieces uh, in a bag and he puts them on his horse cart and he goes to Şanlıurfa Archaeological Museum. Uh, maybe many hours just to get there. So when he reaches the museum, the museum director uh, doesn't believe these pieces would be real pieces. You see, they are very coarsely made and he believes that this man, this villager, was trying to get money from the museum and so on. He says, take them back, we don't need them. After carrying them in his horse cart for many hours, he gets really angry and he says, take them, it is all yours. I would never carry them back in anymore. Then the museum director understands his seriousness and uh, the museum director chooses the safest way. He says, all right, leave them here. And then he calls his man, he makes a report, he writes down everything that he gets from this man. They put them in a bag, he buys him a lunch and then puts them in the storage place in the museum. And this is one part of the story. Now we're going to look at the other part of the story. 
This is the archaeological museum in Şanlıurfa. This is the new version of the old museum. When that farmer went to the museum, it was the earlier museum. It's much smaller than this. This is a section in the museum called as Nevali Churi. Nevali Churi is the name of an archaeological site. And uh, this site was going to stay under the water of the Atatürk Dam on the Euphrates River. So that's why they had to make some rescue excavations there. The name is Nevali Churi. So excavations, rescue excavations over there took place between 1983 and 1991. One of the archaeologists that worked there was Hauptmann, German, and the other one was Klaus Schmidt. Klaus Schmidt is the man for us today. So we're going to talk about him and his discovery of Göbekli Tepe. Klaus Schmidt worked with Hauptmann for the Nevali Churi excavations before the water filled in the whole area. After the excavations ended there, Klaus Schmidt, with all the experience that he obtained from uh, Nevali Churi, he was looking for a new place to excavate. He was going through the literature, he was going uh, around the villages and so on. One day, he is uh, invited uh, for a meal at the Museum of Archaeology, in the earlier uh, old museum. And they are friends with the museum director and the other employees of the museum and so on. Klaus Schmidt is finished with his dig. Who knows, if he cannot find a new place, he is going to go back to Germany. This is the case. But he is very curious. He keeps asking about new discoveries, new finds, new uh, information and so on. Suddenly, during the meal, the museum director remembers uh, the villager, the farmer that brought those sculpture. He tells his man, why don't you bring that uh, bag which we kept many years ago in our storage place. So they bring the bag, they open the bag and Klaus, the moment he sees these pieces of sculpture, he recognizes them. Because the pieces that he sees there are very similar to what he found in Nevali Churi. Now he has the experience. Now he has the knowledge. Now he can combine it in his mind. He gets excited. He asks, where did you get them from? And he gets, he gathers all of the information and then he goes to the place. He finds that mulberry tree area and uh, all the flint pieces are glittering with the uh, sunshine and he sees pieces of rocks sticking out from the field. He recognizes, he identifies this place to be a Neolithic place. He goes back to Germany and he comes back to Turkey and they get the necessary permissions and with the permission of the Turkish Minister of Culture and Tourism in 1995 Klaus Schmidt starts excavating Göbekli Tepe. Up until uh, 2014, Klaus worked there uh, hectically and uh, very unexpectedly uh, in 2014, Klaus Schmidt unfortunately passed away. So uh, the excavations are still continuing there, but without Klaus there now. Before the excavation, this was the area there. Our landmark is the mulberry tree. That's why I always uh, point at the mulberry tree so that we know where we are looking at. And when the excavations started, this is what happened in the same area. Where is our mulberry tree? In here. Let me go back, you see. The mulberry tree is here and this is all empty. Look what happens. the mulberry tree here and they started excavating this area first and then more around here, around here and here. The whole area, the excavation area of Göbekli Tepe 
is approximately 300 meters by 300 meters. This is such a large area. So by feet, it is 1,000 feet by 1,000 feet. Uh, in this land, we could fit 12 soccer fields, football fields. So imagine the size. Only like 5%, maybe 10% of the whole area uh, has been excavated so far. They started with this section first. In the early years of the excavation, this is what I remember. This, this is a picture that I took many years ago. I used to take groups there uh, as a tour guide. And we would be able to walk in this very primitive walkway, uh, getting very close to the uh, pieces that they excavated there. You see, these are my uh, American travelers uh, who are looking at the things from so close. See the uh, reliefs of animals on the T-shaped stones and so on. This is how it was. Today, it has become like this. You know, in archaeology, as you dig, things uh, get vulnerable. When you take things out, when the winter comes, harsh winter conditions, snow, wind, rain, so they damage the place. That's why they had to protect the place with a, a cover, with a roof like this. With some international funds, a few years ago, they were able to make this awning. And now they made a walking path still underneath the uh, awning. You can walk around it, but you cannot go into the uh, uh, place anymore. So what did they find in this place? What did Klaus uh, find uh, in the excavations of uh, Göbekli Tepe? He found gigantic size T-shaped megaliths, gigantic stones, stels. So as you see, it makes a T-shape and they are very big and they are placed like in circles and so on. Klaus couldn't locate any traces of living in this area. And uh, he also noticed that the date of these megaliths would go back to 10,000 BC. 10,000 uh, is the beginning of the Neolithic age it is 12,000 years before now. Uh, and uh, although Neolithic age started here and there, obviously uh, he couldn't find uh, settled life traces in this area. So especially the first 500 years of Göbekli Tepe uh, was uh, thought to be pre-agriculture. Uh, because domestic seeds appeared only 500 years later. So the beginning of Göbekli Tepe is 10,000 uh, and first 500 years of Göbekli Tepe is uh, nomadic and no living traces and no traces of agriculture, more uh, hunter-gatherer type of people. Only 500 years later, we start seeing uh, the domesticated seeds. And uh, we understood that it was still the time of hunter-gatherers in the first 500 years of Göbekli Tepe. Now let me show you uh, a plan of uh, Göbekli Tepe. So this is the whole area. 12 soccer fields would fill in here. The uh, mulberry tree should be somewhere here. The first four of the uh, uh, enclosures with the T-shaped stones uh, placed in the circle uh, were found in here. And they named these enclosures in the time that they excavated them. This is enclosure A, and then they excavated enclosure B, and then enclosure C, D, E, and F. Although they didn't excavate the other parts yet, they did the georadar uh, scanning of the whole area, what is underground, to be able to understand that. And they found that still underground, uh, there were many more of these uh, circular enclosures, underground, unexcavated, and the total number of circular buildings 
would be more than 20 altogether. But so far it is six circular uh, enclosures. And each circular building, each enclosure has about 10 to 12 T-shaped stones in the circle. 10 to 12. 10 to 12 T-shaped stones in the circle. And uh, two of these T-shaped stones in the center. So, did I say 10 to 12 around the circle? And two of them would be in the center. And these two are higher than the ones around. So if you calculated all of the... Uh, uh, megaliths, T-shaped stones in the whole area, it would make uh, totally like 250 or 300 uh, stones. Uh, these megaliths, these T-shaped stones, these stels uh, are about one and a half meters to six meters high. So maximum six meters high that would make from five to 20 feet. And the maximum weight of these stones per each, they will not be more than 20 tons. So uh, this is the situation uh, that we have. Comes our next question. These T-shaped stones, what are they made of? What kind of tools did they use? And how did they shape them? 